So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our April lunchtime expedition presentation. Um, joining us in person or those of you joining us virtually via Zoom. My name is Corey Anko. If you don't know, me, don't know me, I am the curator of the Draper Natural History Museum. Helping me run all of the AV today is Amy Phillips, curatorial assistant in the booth. So quick round of applause for Amy. Thank you. We appreciate you immensely, and so does everybody online. Um, just a couple quick announcements. If you do this with me here, take your mobile cellular device, turn that ringer all the way off or on airplane mode. Um, we do like a distraction-free presentation, and your pres presenter will appreciate that as well. If you'd like to be added to our lunchtime expedition listserv, we send out a reminder two weeks before every talk. Please come find me. We'll get your name down on the clipboard with an email, and then you'll receive an email from us um, two weeks out or sometimes a week out before the presentation advertising our next speaker. You can also access previous uh, speaker presentations from them. Um, we have been fortunate enough to offer these programs for free thanks to generous sponsorship from Sage Creek Ranch and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation. Um, while many of our speakers are local, like Joe today, uh, we have several speakers that do travel to provide these lectures, which means we are covering the expenses associated with their travel and lodging. If you feel compelled to donate and help support these programs and the Draper Natural History Museum, please come find me at the end of the lecture. And um, we have a couple different ways you may be able to do that. Um, we are grateful to all of our supporters and sponsors who have year after year allowed us to bring these programs to the public. If any of you were paying attention to our trivia questions that were circulating above hand, the first one was between 2006 and 2016, Central Wyoming College's ICCE program found 16 millimeters of ice depth lost and on the Din Woody Glacier. And the second question was, the answer to that was, the Cody Shell represents what kind of environment? Anybody get that one? Marine. And this layer contains fossils of ammonites, nautilus, and clams. So if you'd like to learn more about the local geology in the region, please check out our web series, Layers with Larry. You can find that on YouTube. And on our final trivia question was, what hair did that hair belong to, that slide belong to? Any guesses? Porcupine, good guess, but incorrect. <laughs> was not a beaver. <laughs> it was an ungulate. It was a deer. So, so today we are going to hear from Joe Skorupski. Joe has been a fisheries management biologist in the Cody region for the past seven years. Prior to transferring to Cody, he has worked in the Green River region in the same capacity for two years and for three years as an endangered fish biologist in the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Joe earned his Bachelor's of Science from Mansfield University of Pennsylvania and his Master's of Science from University of North Texas working in Yellowstone National Park related to the restoration and the conservation of West Slope cutthroat trout. Joe resides in Cody with his wife and two children, enjoying time with them in the outdoors fishing, hunting, or anything else outdoors. It also happened to be Joe's birthday on Tuesday, so if you'd all wish Joe a happy birthday with me on the count of three, I'm sure he'd greatly appreciate it. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Joe! <laughs> all right, without further ado, please welcome Joe Skorupski. Great. Well, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Well, I appreciate the, the birthday wish, and uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about Yellowstone cutthroat trout and just really a broad perspective on, you know, the, the history of the species of, and the management and future conservation actions specific to the Bighorn Basin. So just a little bit of outline of what I'll generally cover. Uh, this afternoon. I'll introduce the species, uh, specific the YSC is the, the acronym that you'll see for, for that species. Just providing a little bit of background, some of the challenges that Yellowstone cutthroat trout uh, endure or have endured, and some of those, for some of those reasons, why it thrusted this conservation actions uh, for the species specifically. And then talk about what game and fish specifically does uh, for, 
for the conservation of the species and the strategies, getting into a little more of the details of an older model that we kind of embarked on and this, this new model of, of conserving uh, the species itself and some of our future actions that we envision happening over the coming years. So before diving in specifically for Yellowstone cutthroat trout, looking at a broad perspective of trout in the West, uh, native trout in the West and their historic ranges, we have all the different species that reside. And in the orange, you can see the orange bubbles. Those are the cutthroat themselves. And if we parse that, that orange out, you can see all the different species of cutthroat trout that exist. But for today's purpose, we're going to talk about our only native, species, or only native cutthroat trout that we have in the region, which is the Yellowstone cutthroat trout. And zooming in on their historical distributions and looking at cutthroat trout themselves, the blue lines are where they historically occupied habitat through Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and Nevada. So if we fast forward to current distributions, looking at where they were to where they are currently. You can see in the red overlaid on top of that blue that there's been some pretty drastic changes in their overall distribution. And that's about a 43% of currently occupied habitat of what it used to be historically. And if you parse that even closer and looking at just those that are intact populations, it's really only 17%. So some pretty drastic changes in their range over the last you know, several decades. But we're here to talk about the Cody region, so looking specifically to the Bighorn Basin, zooming in on that, that part of the pie in, in our corner of the world, you can see that those blue lines that are the historical distributions, and then the red lines, which are the uh, currently occupied distributions of our conservation populations. So we're in the, in the Cody region itself, in the Bighorn Basin, it's right around 30% of currently occupied habitats but more in the realm of that 10% of where we think that it's, uh, we have secure, um, unaltered genetic populations. So obviously some things have changed over the years and why they changed. And in those declines, you know, that, that first is obviously over harvest is, is always a concern of overconsumption of individuals, of a population. You know, historically the game and fish did not exist. It was unharbored harvest. So from this historical picture, you can see that it was pretty, pretty wild what people would, would consume on the landscape uh, back across history. But there's also other threats, uh, specifically you know, habitat degradation. If you think about where, what the landscape looked like well over 100 years ago to what it looks like now, there's lots of human impacts and habitat degradation that's occurred across the range, including water development, mining, logging, grazing, all those things impact this species pretty significantly. But hands down, the, the most impactful that we see today and challenges that, that exist that are, that are something that we can do something about are uh, the non-native trout that exist on the landscape. And this is, you know, rainbow trout are the, the first one that I'll introduce, and, and that's a species that's, that's capable of hybridizing. That's the crossing of those species, so it creates a, a combination of both cutthroat trout and yeah, uh, uh, different forms of rainbow trout. So the picture below, North Fork is a great example. We have lots of hybrid individuals that exist in the North Fork. But there's also brown trout, lake trout, and brook trout that compete and predate on Yellowstone cutthroat trout. We all know the story of the long history that's been going on in Yellowstone Lake with the lake trout, as you can see from the picture below. But also brown trout and Brook trout are uh, more aggressive. They outcompete Yellowstone cutthroat trout where they currently exist. So all these species, how they got here, they were stocked historically, uh, dating back to the to the late 1800s, and you know that's it's just some historical perspective on you know what how species are being distributed at a really massive rate along railroad cars and lots of different mechanisms, all the way leading up to. Uh, not not too distant uh, past that we've been still doing that. So, so some of the consequences of these declines and what we saw uh, for the species, as 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 I just pointed out for this this map itself of the Cody region, uh, it really prompted these declines. Really prompted actions. And in 1998, 
the species was petitioned for listing. Uh, fortunately, they were, it was deemed not warranted, but it did prompt the formation of the Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout Conservation Team. And this team is a conglomerate of individuals, of partners across all the states, across all the ranges, that came up with a, a whole list of, they identified the problems obviously, and then they came up with a whole list of uh, broad solutions to address those declines. And the solutions are obviously what I'm gonna talk about and what we're doing. But before getting into that, just kind of wanted to ground this in a little bit of conservation biology, you know, that, that we kind of took on a little bit more focused in the Cody region itself. So broadly speaking, the definition of conservation biology, I don't like to read it, but I will. It's the management of nature with the aim of protecting species, their habitats and ecosystems from excessive rates of loss and extinction. So essentially trying to prevent a species from, from extinction, from blinking out in the landscape. And historically this was uh, done much more of an individual pop population basis. It really focused on uh, minimum number of individuals and trying to not lose a specific population. A couple examples are condors. They, you know, of, of doing captive broods uh, for condors and more locally the uh, black-footed ferrets. So good examples of what, what some conservation biology actions were taken historically. But thinking about that, uh, from a more broad perspective, it has shifted uh, to looking at species on a more landscape scale, not individual populations or individuals themselves. And one great example in the Cody region, I'm sorry, in the, in the West, it, are sage grouse. It's thinking about how do we make sure that that species exists across its entire range. And how that can be applied to fish species is, is how I'll kind of transition this from here on out. Um, but Basically, those same principles apply for trout on the landscape, specifically Yellowstone cutthroat trout. So the three basic principles that, that guide conservation biology are representation, resiliency, and redundancy. And these are really the, the, the foundation of, of how to move forward with making sure that the species exists into perpetuity. So to get into a little bit of detail in each of those, uh, explaining those definitions themselves, representation, this one's kind of a two, two-fold that I'll explain a little bit, but the first is genetic. Making sure that the, the genetic integrity of that species exists from what it was historically to what it is now. There's lots of different variability across the landscape, which brings up the life history traits. So those are kind of two intertwined. So we have lots of different genetics, different life histories. We wanna make sure that that still exists from what it was to what it, or to, to current day levels. So life history, you can imagine migratory and resident, that's, those are the kind of two life history traits that we kind of point to. So residents, resident individuals and those that move really long distances across their available habitats. The second uh, three, three R of the three R's is resilience. And this is basically, if you think about it in terms of an ability of a population to withstand and rebound from disturbance events. We use fires as a really big, ex big example of this, but you can also think back to last year of all the severe flooding that we had. You know, we wanna make sure that animals that are on the landscape can handle those, those massive disturbance events that, that occur so that if one little portion of the population does get blinked out, that it doesn't mean that we lost the species altogether. The third R is redundancy. Simple explanation, not putting all your eggs in one basket. We want to ensure that they are spread across the landscape in a sufficient manner that allows them to be, to be resilient, redundant across the landscape. So a good example of our, our local area is the gray bull. The gray bull is an amazing fishery. It's an intact Yellowstone cutthroat trout population, one of the most important in the area. But we don't want to just say that the gray bull is enough. We want to make sure that something happens in the gray bull thinking about 100 years forward that they're still gonna exist in the landscape across their entire range. So those are, that's basically conservation biology in a nutshell, but thinking back to those solutions and, and how it's all grounded in conservation biology itself. So what are some of those solutions that, that we can do for the species itself? So the conservation team set out and they, they set three main really broad objectives for 
for doing this. And the first is securing and enhan enhancing existing populations. We want to make sure that we're protecting what we have, like the gray bull. The second is restoring lost populations. So where we saw that massive shrinking of their, their range across the Cody region, we want to see that we can reestablish some of those, those, those new populations. And then the third is securing and enhancing watersheds. The gray bull is another good example. This is a lot grounded in habitat improvements and uh, bolstering resiliency of a population itself. So those, those are the three main key objectives that were set out by the conservation team. But moving forward, we're, I'm kind of going to focus on you know, what, what this restoration of populations really looks like. And we focus heavily on this, this aspect, this number two of the conservation team's recommendations, because it does have some of the largest, most impactful uh, solutions on the landscape. If you think about it, where your time in and effort in and rate of returns there's really nothing that you can do that's any better than saying you took a drainage where you had 20 miles of stream that, occupy, that are occupied by Yellowstone cutthroat trout, increase that to 50 or 100. It's real on the ground um, numerical changes in, for that species itself. So bang for your buck, it's, it's super critical to, to ensure that, that that happens. But I want to talk a little about what restoration looks like and, and Defining that first is a really important part before I move too far forward. And really simple put, this is removing the threats, which are non-native trout. That's you know the, what I talked about with hybridization, competition, and predation on, on Yellowstone cutthroat trout, and reintroducing or introducing the species itself. And we, I talk about it in terms of introduction versus reintroduction because we don't limit that to just historical ranges. As I kind of pointed out with all the threats that are happening with uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout historical habitat, it's really been pinched and squeezed to only be able to accomplish that in certain parts of their historical range. You know, we're not going to be treating or, or restoring trout populations to, you know, the main stem of the Shoshone River on the lower Shoshone. That's just something that's not, not feasible. So headwater isolation is how we term that, and that, that's really what a lot of that focus is in those appropriate habitats where it has the highest probability of success. So what are the, some of the ways that we, can, that we can restore cutthroat trout? And there's a, a whole litany of, of techniques that we can employ, and I'll kind of culminate it all down to the, the, the most critical one. Uh, but the, the first is what we call genetic swamping. So we know what genetics are, as I kind of explained them, we want to make sure that that, that species still exists. But it's, it's done through really heavy stocking of that native species, trying to more or less swamp out the other non-native genetics. But this only works in hybridized populations, not where they're competing or trying to, or being predated on by other non-natives like brown trout and brook trout. And this strategy was generally employed uh, for trying to keep them existing in the North Fork. Over 13 million fish, Yellowstone cutthroat trout, were stocked in the North Fork in the 90s or throughout the 90s. And as you all know, that it still it did not move the needle for bolstering those populations of cutthroat trout. We continue to lose and see that shrinking of those populations. So an option, but not a great option, basically, as, as a singular tool. The, the second is mechanical removal. This is going out and electrofishing and physically removing those individuals. As you can imagine, it's, it's really labor intensive, it's costly, and it takes years and years to, to try to move the needle on this at all. Uh, it's about 30 to 80% efficient, and one great example of this is Soda Butte Creek, that's right in our backyard. And this was done for almost 20 years for the removal of brook trout. And essentially, at the end of the day, all the brook trout couldn't be removed was the takeaway. So, something that was really labor, labor intensive, really expensive, it still didn't get us to where we need to be to say that that popula population in Soda Butte is restored and secure. The other is one of the two options that allows you to eliminate all non-native species, which is dewatering, but as we all know, dewatering in a stream is extremely difficult and not n really ecologically sound in a lot of ways. So not really a viable option for, for a lot of streams. There's some lakes that it could be viable for, but 
a really limited strategy and not even one that we really consider. And then the last is the use of piscicides, specifically rotenone, to where you're applying a, a really low dosage of a chemical that uh, euthanizes the non-natives so that those native species can be restored. So moving forward, this is kind of what I'm going to focus on, but I just want to define this a little bit and try to explain it a little bit more for a little bit of background. So what is rotenone and, and how does it work? It is a naturally occurring compound that's derived from darus roots in South America. This is something that's been used for years and years by indigenous people down there. And they have, they grind up the roots, they would put it into a bag and release it into the, the streams or little pools. And that would euthanize those, those fish that were present and they would use them for consumption purposes. So how it works is it causes uh, tissue anoxia on only gill breathing organisms. So this is a picture of the cell and really simple, simply put, it does not allow for oxidative phosphorylation to occur, which does not allow for ATP production. The good thing with rotenone is it is a natural compound that does break down really quickly in its natural state, uh, both by temperature and photolysis. So those kind of going into now, like how are we, wh what was our early efforts for restoration? We kind of pointed out the problem. We know how to address the problem. Non-natives are a major concern. We need to do this restoration work to ensure that the species continues on the landscape or expands on the landscape. So how do we actually go about doing this? So looking at the Cody region, we have seven major drainages that we call them. Everybody probably recognizes most of these from the Bighorn, No Wood, Upper Bighorn to the Clark's Fork. And historically, or in more recent history, it was, it was really easy to identify a couple places that we could go. And these projects do take a significant amount of time, but where where that had happened or where it was most logical was securing and expanding existing populations. We have three really good examples that, that have been done here uh, in, in the recent history, and that's Dry Medicine Lodge, South Paint Rock, and, and locally here we have uh, Dead Indian. So those three were, were completed successfully, and then we kind of transitioned to, okay, now where do we go from here? What, what, else, what, el what other places should we be going and doing this work? So this is kind of getting into more of the, of the process of the restoration efforts. So that's, that's how we started approaching it in, in recent history. But how this was actually done uh, on the ground was uh, a person like myself, a biologist, would say, you know, this, this drainage looks really appropriate. It has all the appropriate habitat, has a barrier, has all the criteria that makes it a really good restoration project. Then I would go out, I'd do a ton of reconnaissance surveys, I'd do fish distributions, velocity, discharge, I'd come up with a giant plan, I'd have meetings with Trout Unlimited, you know, uh, county commissioners, and kind of pitch the project and, and have discussions. And then we would roll out our, our public meetings on the back end of all that. And that was generally the way that these worked and, and how they worked historically. Unfortunately, in the last two projects that were, were put out is while we did a lot of work to you know, vet these projects in, in closed groups and with our partners, we were obviously missing something because at these last two meetings, this is a, a direct quote from the paper, you know, while, while the big picture is conserving a native species that is under siege, the remedy was met with anger and disappointment. And this really gave us a lot of pause on what are we doing? What do, what do we need to do to, to move the needle? And, you know, like I said, this, this caused us to step back from two different proposed projects, Eagle Creek and Porcupine Creek. And it was obvious that, you know, we, we had some work to do. We had to figure out how to get over these, these, these social challenges that, that existed. You know, looking at this, this new model or this, the old model of pitching a project, collecting all the data, and, and having those public meetings, it, it obviously we, we were missing something through that process. So we stepped back and said, what do we need to do? We know the biology. We know what we need to do to, to move the needle, but we're obviously well out of our depths in terms of those social challenges. So we took this model and we said, instead of having these public meetings on the back end, let's 
put those to the front end and engage in a collaborative learning process. And let's move forward with not talking from a project to project basis, but more on a landscape, landscape scale, talking about the Bighorn Basin as a whole. So that's what we did. We, this was initiated in 2017, collaborative learning. And we started this process, it took about three years. So definition of collaborative learning, it's an unbounded process in which independent parties work together to affect the future of an issue of shared interests. And that shared interest is really important. So what this does is it focuses on concerns and interests, not, not the positions of, I want to see this here and not there kind of concept. And everybody has an opportunity to be heard and listened to, and everybody learns together. It's the public coming together with their interests and talking through the whole problem as, as a whole, not just as a, a specific project. And at the end of the day, you, the, the group will craft a, a list of solutions that balance all of those social and biological interests. So we call this the Cody Cutthroat Collaborative. You can probably still see it on our, our regional website. This, is, this was something that was, as I said, well outside of our depth. We're all trained biologists, Jason, Sam, and I. We are not social scientists. So hiring a facilitator was really important to do this. And it also removed us from that, that part of it so that it wasn't, we weren't biasing that situation at all. We were able to participate in the process, but we weren't leading it in terms of, of dictating how things were gonna be discussed. It was the facilitator that did all of that work. I'm not gonna list all this, but I just wanted to highlight that, you know, this was slung out to every single resource that we possibly had. You probably have all in the room have, have heard about it, hopefully. Uh, lots of different um, approaches to, you know, geotargeting Facebook posts to news releases and, and everything under the sun. Basically, no rock was unturned to try to get the word out for the public like yourselves to come and participate in this meeting or these series of meetings. So what does the collaborative process look like uh, specific to, to this, these goals and what were the goals and objectives? And essentially, it's, it's what we, we talked about. We wanted a, a a list of recommendations to where we could do future conservation work for cutthroat trout and the Bighorn Basin. But we set some pretty specific guide sideboards to this to really bound us through that, that process, which were all agreed upon within that, that public group. And the first is conserving cutthroat trout is important and not doing anything is not an option. It, it has to be done. We need to move forward with this. It's just how do we do it and where do we go? The second is, after that list of recommendations, Game and Fish has the authority to, to prioritize that list. And then the third is that this is only for the Cody region, the Bighorn Basin itself. So what this looked like is, it's the, the collaborative process for the cutthroat meetings were three rounds of meetings across the three different main communities, being Cody, Lovell, and Warland. And three series of meetings, the first being it was really to bring the public together, gauge their interests, gauge their concerns, and ask them, what do you want to hear from us? What, what, what part of this process, what, what do you guys not understand so that we can inform you to, to make good decisions on, on where we need to go with these projects? So what we heard from the public and some of you in this group that I can see that participated is we were really con they were really concerned about diverse fishing opportunities. They wanted to maintain that. They wanted to prote protect existing Yellowstone cutthroat trout populations, and prioritize historical occupied habitats, and be responsible with the resources that we're given as an agency, both our time and, and money that goes into these projects. So round two is more of our opportunity. We, we listened to the group and we said, okay, these are the, these are the things that, that they wanna hear and learn about which is basically the science and biology behind uh, the historical distributions of Yellowstone cutthroat trout, just like those maps that I showed you, where non-natives exist across those that, that co-occupy that habitat or exist on the landscape where we could potentially consider removing those, those individuals. Uh, so a lot about habitat requirements and the restoration process itself, some of which I touched on earlier, and options for removing non-native trout and then really important was how much is enough? That what's the end goal for us in the Cody region? How, much, how far did we wanna go with this? 
So we set bounds on, on that throughout this process as well, which was, I think was really critical. So round three was they got the, so they, they, they pitched what their concerns were, they got the information they needed, and now it was time to sit down and weigh out all the options and come up with final recommendations. And this was just a ton of, of group discussion, you know, pouring over these, mop, these maps of historical distributions and where cutthroat ex exists, where we have barriers. It was, it was a really great process to watch them go through on their own. And then they came up with a list of, of final recommendations. So where did we end with this? What, what did the group discuss and what, what were those recommendations? So they considered over 27 different stream networks across the region. And of those 27, they decided that 16 were appropriate places to be considered, or we call them highly endorsed projects. And then of those 16, seven of those, from our perspective, met really high standards for social and biological uh, viability. So what does that mean for looking at the Cody region and and where, where this would take us of those seven projects, looking back at that map of the areas that they considered, and what, what that, where that landed us was it created two potential projects in the, the Bighorn Lake drainage. That'd be Upper Shell and Willett Creeks. The NOAA drainage was East Ten Sleep Creek and Canyon Creek. And then the Clarks Fork was Crandall Creek. The North Fork was Eagle Creek and the South Fork was the, the Upper South Fork, way at the headwaters up there. So as you can see, it, it really, we landed in a really successful spot with, with a whole list of, of, of projects to, to, to consider, and that would really bolster the, the conservation of the species in, in the Cody region. And it, this whole process really showed us that you can bridge both biological and social desires uh, on a landscape scale. It was a great process. I was really happy to be part of it. I was glad some of you in this room were part of it. It was, I learned a lot from a lot of individuals in the room and it was a, a really intriguing process to go through. And for cutthroat trout, they, they land in a really great place. So those are the recommendations, but where do we go from here and where are we now? So as I said, of those 16 projects, uh, I said seven were ones that met those general needs but three really stood out as being high priority areas that met all of the biological and social needs that, that we discussed throughout this whole process. And these were kind of categorized as our highest priority areas. So that first priority area is Crandall Creek itself. And Crandall Creek is a really big system. It's interconnected, it's over 64 miles. It ranked really high throughout this whole project. It ranked high with game and fish, well before that process even, the collaborative learning even was embarked on. And we have a lot to lose in there. Rainbow trout exist in that population. It is a conservation population, so it just categorizes as being a really important population. But rainbow trout are hybridizing and, and whittling away at that, that genetic integrity of that population. So ranked high, really important, interconnected habitat. It hit every box that you could possibly think of to be an important place to go. So we've been working on that for the last couple years and are continuing to work on that today. East Tensleep Creek was the, the second one, and that's in, as I said earlier, that's in the Noah drainage. So well across the other side of the basin, I guess that way. And currently what we're working on there is, you know, we did a lot of reconnaissance work or some reconnaissance work, and we identified a barrier site. We're moving forward with trying to get a, uh, the, the paperwork completed for completing a barrier, and this one's a little bit different. It also has a lot to lose, but it's, it's brook trout. Their Yellowstone cutthroat trout exist. Brook trout coexist with them. It's a historically occupied area for cutthroat trout, so another really high priority for, for the cutthroat collaborative learner learning process. But brook trout are, we are seeing declines in that population every single year to the point of where we're concerned that we could lose that population if action is not taken. So. That's kind of where we are now with, with in that plan and, and working on Yellowstone cutthroat trout conservation in these two main, main drainages. And I just wanted to kind of wrap this up and highlight a couple things of, of the, the whole process. You know, we, I really heavily focused on 
the restoration process, the collaborative learning, and where, where we were, where we are now. We're sitting in a really great place. But the, the first step is to restore the population. It's, it's not, it doesn't mean the, end, the work ends. And I think this is really important of that, that third task that the conservation team put out, and that's enhancing watershed health on a whole. That just because that species exists in a drainage and we restored it does not mean the work is done. You guys probably heard the talk, or hopefully some of you were here, that, that Jerry gave a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago on beaver translocations and talking about just their, the importance of them as being ecosystem engineers. They create really great habitat for cutthroat trout. This is a picture of Trout Creek. Uh, I wish I had a second one next to it that I could have showed you. You know, it's, it's literally a 15 foot wide stream throughout the rest of that habitat. And beaver have completely transformed that drainage. Uh, really intact repairing habitat, makes it resilient to fires, all of those things. Uh, habitat improvements in general, you've probably seen a lot of the work that's been done in the Grable. Lots of great work, connecting habitat, removing culverts, all of those things, and public outreach as well, doing meetings like this, trying to inform the public of what we're doing and, and how your dollars are being spent. And I think one project that, that we kind of uh, embarked on since I think this started in 2008. This is an interpretive sign that was that was put together for the South Paint Rock drainage and this really highlights everything that's been done kind of putting a bow on that whole big picture what's our end game with, with doing this work and where does it take us and in that drainage specifically you know we've we as I say a collective we of partners and that's throughout all this project including Trout Unlimited, the Forest Service, uh, the Natural Resource Trust Fund to generate dollars for this good work. You know, it's removing culverts, connecting the habitat, uh, building off water channel or tanks so that the cows are not directly in the channel all summer long, rebuilding fences to maintain those habitats and protect those habitats, building fences that, you know, remove ungulates and planting woody uh, vegetation to that restores that habitat itself. This is kind of the, the end goal for, for all of that and, and one of our, our highlights definitely of the region. And hopefully you've seen this interpretive sign. Hopefully you've been up to this area and enjoyed the, the great fishing that's in, this is Soldier Creek specifically, but in the South Paint Rock drainage. Uh, this sign sits over those meadows and, and hopefully you all have, have an opportunity to go up there and, and see the sign and kind of see that whole collective collaboration of work that's done for Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout and get to enjoy some of the fishing that's, that's in that, that little drainage. With that, I'll take any questions. And, and I will, I'll repeat the questions, so. Go ahead, sir. So those currently are occupied by cutthroat trout. And, and the question was, are you, it was the, the south fork of the wood, the main wood, and the middle wood. Yeah. Yep, so those are tributaries. So the wood itself collectively is a tributary to the, the Grable drainage. And those are, I, I don't recall where exactly those barriers end or start. But there is a lot of intact habitat that exists throughout that drainage itself. So that's all historically occupied drainage. So those are, that's, that's some of the best. So when we say the gray bowl, that includes the wood as well. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Could you describe the barriers that you create in order to protect the upper watersheds? Yeah, that's a great question. So barriers, the most ideal barrier is the barrier that we don't have to build. And those are, generally speaking, we use the general rule of thumb as it's a six foot drop to, to, to build a, an appropriate barrier that fish cannot mi upstream migrate. So downstream migration is fine. It's that upstream migration that's, that's the concern. So trout have jumping capabilities, and we want to make sure that they can't jump or, or climb up this barrier. 
those are done in a lot of different ways. There's, there's opportunities to where if you have good granitic system, you can sculpt rock to create better barriers or better drops. Uh, I've seen them built out of just strictly concrete where they're, you pour concrete, you divert the little the stream, and this is, can only be done in fairly small systems. And so like the one on East Tensleep will be a concrete barrier. And then a lot of times you can armor that with uh, creating uh, gabion baskets or riprap or something like that to make sure that that is a really confined system. So yeah, I've seen them built out of log. I've seen them built out of concrete, lots of different things, but that's kind of the general benchmark is right around five, six feet of a vertical barrier. Where is Dave, real quick from Trout and Lemon, could you raise your hand? Dave, we want to take a moment to acknowledge and appreciate and thank uh, Trout and Lemon, the Eastern chapter here, for providing those uh, Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout posters um, for free. So that was provided by Trout Unlimited um, on behalf of this talk. So Dave, thank you so much. And Dave's going to hang around um, after as well if folks would like to um, chat with him about uh, being a part of Trout Unlimited. So we'll continue on with the questions. And anybody that didn't get a poster, they're right out of the exit there, so. I'll go here first, sorry. I understand that this year has been particularly hard on undulates in Wyoming, and I'm wondering, is there any carryover for trout in that, uh, or has this been, uh, is that a good thing for them to survive this winter? Yeah, generally speaking, I would say it's, we're not concerned of a hard, long winter that's, that's detrimental to trout populations. You know, the, the one thing that's really good with winter is that, that stabilizes those habitats is going into the winter with decent base flows. So base flows is basically as low as you kind of want them to get. And we had a really wet fall, generally speaking, and things were looking pretty good. Uh, what we are concerned with is coming on the heels of last year's flooding events that we saw in the Clark's Fork drainage, you know, what's, what's that gonna do this year? Is, is that something that's, is that frequency going to increase? Is it something that could happen again this year, back to back years? And yeah, so that, that's generally a, a more of a concern. It's those really short pointed extreme events, you know, that if they start becoming more frequent over the years, that's more of a concern. You showed a picture, I think, from the 1800s of them stocking fish. Mm -hmm. what, what type of fish were they stocking back then in this stream? Oh, lots of different flavors. I mean, everything from brook trout, brown trout. They've tried steelhead, coho, and, the re and this is just in Cody. I mean, it's, yeah, they're different salmonids that they're everything that you could possibly think of they were stocking, including cutthroat trout. Uh, that's generally why there are cutthroat in Crandall Creek is because they were stocked historically. The cutthroat were native, but we were doing active stocking, yeah. So if that makes sense. Yeah, so we had hatcheries and still have hatcheries where we still stock for both recreational purposes for cutthroat trout and for conservation work. Is there a question from our online audience? Yeah, so we've got two questions from our online audience. Um, the first one, Joe, the rotenoid, I don't know how to say that. Rotenone. Rotenone um, exposure. We have a question about its linkage with Parkinson's disease and how um, workers are warned about it and how they kind of distribute that. Yeah, so that was a, an unfortunate paper that was published, I think, in 2000 and seven or six that linked a little bit of background of that. They claimed that there was a linkage between Parkinson's and rotenone is, is what they're referring to. And that was taking rotenone at a really, really high concentration and inj injecting it into the carotid artery of rats. And they saw a response uh, that was adversarial to the individual. So they since then, it was highly refuted, removed. It, that linkage does not exist. It does, and you know, I think you could inject water into your veins and have pretty severe issues. So, so yeah, that's, that's something that has been refuted over the years, and, but it, it continues to come up because you can find that literature online as 
we are very highly interconnected with information anymore, good or bad. All right, and one more. Um, with how can you um, or can you compare and contrast interventions um, in the Bighorn Basin with those on the South Fork of the Snake, if you're familiar with that, and how they may differ? Yeah, so South Fork of the Snake is a very different beast altogether. It has a really intact cutthroat trout population, but there are non-natives present that are competing and hybridizing, specifically rainbow trout, with, with that population. So they're actively going in and removing uh, mostly rainbows and hybrids from that population. They use weirs to try to block off spawning runs and they're, they're high grading and removing uh, those, those hybrid forms and those pure forms of rainbows. And so that's, that's a different approach. That's that mechanical removal, removal approach versus the restoration one. So if you can think of it, what, what their options are in the South Fork of the Snake and not speaking for that group at all, but it's a really, really large system. I mean, they run jet boats on it, rafts. It's a really big river. It would be like, I think it's bigger than the North Fork, Jason, correct? So it's a really large system. So that notion of saying that you're going to go in and do a chemical treatment of a system of that size is just, it's not feasible. So they're at a point right now where, yeah, it's it's very different approach, and it's trying to, it's, I would kind of compare it being similar to the Crandall Creek approach, to where we have 64 miles of interconnected habitat, and we're trying to really focus on a couple portions of that population to to keep our conservation status eligible. Is there evidence that the Cut Slam program is beneficial to the um, cutthroat trout population conservation efforts? Personally, I would say, yeah, I think that it's a great opportunity for folks to kind of, you know, looking at that broad map and, and seeing where cutthroat exists. It's, it, it's been really successful. I think we still get at least 100 applications for the Cut Slam every single year. It's it's something that's kind of a nice token for folks that come and visit and, and live here. I'm still trying to get mine. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great program. I think it's been so successful that other states have established the same thing like Utah. In regards to the non-natives, um, so particularly rainbow and then cut bows, are, are cut bows positive or negative like are you would those stay in the river systems and could we look for changes to the collection the allowed the collection limits um, for the drainages to collect additional rainbow to get those out or how are those how do you target to get the rainbows out of the river yeah so first part of the question are they considered the same once they're hybridized and the answer is no once they're so for a Pure Yellowstone cutthroat trout, that's 100% Yellowstone cutthroat trout. The moment that they hybridize with 100% pure rainbow, they're 50-50. So they've lost that, that conservation value once they start hybridizing. We lose that genetic integrity. And there, there are options to, to do those. And right now, I would say that our regulations are probably sufficient that if individuals, if, if you go, you know, and... Most people don't harvest fish in a lot of these drainages anymore, but if you go and harvest fish, it's, it's certainly not going to hurt anything. Uh, Yellowstone does have a more a loose program for harvest on hybrids, I believe, uh, that they've, I forget the program that they have, that's, it was a college group that they go and they would kill basically anything that had white in its fin. So, so it's something that could be done, but Conservation-wise, it, it doesn't hurt, but it, I don't think it would move the needle in the direction sufficient enough to say that after 10 years of intensive harvest from the public that we would be where we want to be. Unfortunately, I wish, it, I wish that were the case. Question up there.
Yeah, I'll repeat the question since you didn't have the mic. And, and he was asking, is there any implications of climate change on our current Yellowstone cutthroat trout populations of warming streams and, and habitats? And, you know, right now off the top of my head, I, I, I can't point to anything that would say yes. Uh, one of the things that certainly there's people out there that are way smarter than myself that have been modeling this across the ranges and we know that we're going to lose some significant habitat over the years and I think that's you know thinking about that and you know that's that's where it kind of comes into the end game of of this presentation of just because the restore doesn't mean the you know the the efforts over just having them on the landscape isn't isn't where we want to be we want to make sure that they're resilient for years to come if if we fast forward 100 years from now that that they still exist in the landscape landscape but I'm sure there's some streams in the Bighorns that where like Beaver Creek is probably a good example of historically that population probably would have existed all the way to close to the confluence of the Bighorn River. But given its current conditions of dewatering and lots of intense agricultural usage that that's probably driven that a little bit more. So it's, it's hard to make that, that direct linkage, but yeah, certainly habitat loss. Yes, sir. Can you tell us about whirling disease? Whirling disease. What do you want to know? <laughs> uh, so they, they do in specific areas. So in whirling disease, I believe that was early 2000s when it, we thought the sky was falling and it was going to be a major issue and we were going to lose all of our trout popular, oncorhynchus populations in general. And what we've seen is really pointed reductions in certain, certain streams. Off the top of my head, one that's uh, really significant is, is Pebble Creek in the park. That's one where they've kind of made that linkage of where it's those tube effects worms can flourish in those types of sediments. And it's really hindered their, their ability to, to maintain a population in Pebble Creek. So there, there are places, but it's, it's much more uh, linked to what the habitat conditions look like. Yeah, that really fine sediment is where you see issues with growing disease. But it certainly exists across the landscape in a lot of places. Joe, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate thank it. you.